Let's open in our Bibles together to uh, Revelation 17. Revelation 17, and what a precious portion of Scripture we've come to. And after having uh, these weeks to really look into the book of life, as it's presented in Scriptures, I realize this is a crucial uh, section for us to stop on and and really uh, let the full implications uh, descend upon us. But I'll explain that to you as we read. We're going to start in verse 7 of Revelation 17. Now we're getting close to the ending, and it, it's picking up the crescendo here as we're in uh, nearing the end of this book, but this is a marvelous section. Revelation 17, starting in verse 7. You follow along with me, please, as I read. And it says, And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And that little uh, discussion is coming. And there's a little uh, eighth verse that we're going to park on tonight before we get into the woman, the beast, and all that stuff. Verse 8, the beast which you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. Now that's a very, very uh, pregnant sentence. I mean, that, that is a lot of truth. But keep reading. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder. And here's the key phrase we need to consider tonight. Whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And then back to the, the text. When they see the beast that was and is not and will come. I don't know if you've ever thought about how incredible that little eighth verse is. I know that many of you have read through the Bible. There's a lot in there. First of all, you notice the, the uh, kind of reversal of God's name. God is the God who is, who was, and who is to come. But this is talking about someone, uh, the beast, that he was, he is not, and he will come. And a little before that it says, uh, the beast who, who was, is not, and is about to come up and be destroyed. And, and there's kind of a little parallelism there with this, this anti uh, uh, description of, of Satan as opposed to God. But what I want you to look at is that, that last little line of verse 8 where it says, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. There's a lot of theological discussion that's gone in there, but I thought rather than getting all wound up in that, we would just track around the book of life. Because the book of life is crucial for two reasons. Number one, it speaks of security. The book of life is the ultimate statement of God on security. Because the way God puts it, nobody is going to miss heaven that I wanted there, and nobody is going to be in heaven that God did not have the total and absolute control of that presence of that person there. So it is the ultimate statement of security. It shows that everything is not up for grabs, that everything is not... Uh, going to someday pan out that God, before he created the earth, knew the ending already. That's a phenomenal thought. But you can go so far with that thought that you can get into what the 17th century theologians got into, which was the idea that, so what? If it's all figured out, who cares? It's going to happen, and they became fatalists. And the Bible doesn't say that. And let me show you what I mean by looking with me at the book of life, starting in the book of Exodus. We're going to look at every time this book is uh, mentioned in the Bible. And I think that with me, you can draw some conclusions that, that are just very, very evident from the text. In the book of Exodus, chapter 32. And this is such a crucial, crucial study because... God has repeatedly says that only those who are in the Lamb's book of life are going to be in heaven. And therefore, it's very imperative, if you want to be in heaven, that you make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And it says in Exodus 32, starting in verse 32, but now, and Jim referred to this this morning as he preached uh, about... Moses' compassion, even though uh, he dealt with this lifelong problem of anger. But now, if thou wilt, 
forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out from the book which thou hast written. You realize that Moses, number one, was aware that God had a book. Number two, he knew that whoever was written in this book was going to heaven. And number three, he realized that God was the only one that could determine that. And the fourth thing is, the people that are in that are the ones, verse 32, that have been forgiven. You see what it says in 32? If thou wilt forgive their sin. In other words, people that are in that book are the ones that God has forgiven their sin. Now, that's, that's all this verse says. There's a book, and, and Moses said in, in his great intercessory prayer, God, I know you have this book, and I know the people in there are the ones that are going to spend eternity with you, and I love them so much, the ones that are here so sinful, that you can consign me to hell if they can go to heaven. That was, that was one of the two most magnificent human efforts at showing God's redeeming love. You remember the other one is the Apostle Paul who says in the book of Romans, I would wish myself accursed. Same thing. Consigned to eternal destruction for Israel. Both of them loved Israel that much. But now, the next verse has the second little truth about that. The first one is that Moses knew of his, his existence. He knew that it dealt with people's whether their sins were forgiven or not. He knew that it determined whether or not they were going to be with God. And he knew that God was the sole proprietor and and author of this book. Verse 33. Here's the Lord's answer. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now that's interesting. What sin would get you erased or blotted out? And wait a minute. Does that mean those people were supposed to go to heaven and they lost it? And you, you understand what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of discussion. And if we just parked here or parked in any one of these, you could just really build a a whole theological system around speculation. But thankfully, this isn't the only place it occurs. Keep going now to the middle of your Bible, Psalm 69. We're going to look at the next occurrence of, of this book, Psalm 69 in verse 28. And, uh, again, the psalmist is, is talking about sinners, um, He's been talking about them all the way through this, starting in verse 22. Uh, May their table become a snare. Verse 23, may their eye grow dim. Verse 24, pour out your indignation on them. Verse 25, may their camp be desolate. Verse 26, they have persecuted him whom thou hast smitten. They tell of the pain of those whom thou hast wounded. On and on. Now look at verse 28 of Psalm 69. May they, this is one of those imprecatory psalms, the ones where, uh, where the psalmist is praying down judgment, imprecatory, their prayers of, of judgment. May they be blotted out of the book of life. That's the first time in the Old Testament that the whole name is given. Uh, Moses just called it the book. God called it my book in Exodus 32. But now, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, we know what it's called. It's called the book of life. And may they not be recorded with the righteous. Now, there's something else you can learn here. That this book is a record of the righteous. And that there can be people blotted out of it who, verse 27, may they not come to thy righteousness. People who do not come to God's righteousness get blotted out. And that's all it says. It doesn't explain whether the ones in there are saved or lost or whatever before they get blotted and all that. So there's no controversy between uh, uh, a theological system. It's just a fact. Now, the next instance starts helping us. If you look at Daniel chapter 12 with me, please, uh, let's keep going to the right. Daniel 12. This is a fascinating verse. And uh, last chapter of Daniel. Remember, Daniel is the Old Testament key to all of the prophets. And Daniel merges with the book of Revelation to give us... um, God's master plan for the earth. And it says in chapter 12 of Daniel, Now, at that time, which is uh, the end times, Michael, and then describes who this Michael is. He's an angel we've met before in the Bible. The great prince, now here's what Michael's uh, official office is with God, who stands guard over the sons of your people. 
Michael is the angel that's entrusted with the defense and care of Israel, God's people. Very interesting. Uh, when uh, this, this Michael will arise, and there will be a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Now, that's, that's amazing. You know what that says? It says that there's a time coming in the future when God is going to act in regard to the people of Israel, and Michael is going to do something during a time where there's going to be terrible conditions on the earth like there have never been since the beginning of time. And when he does that, God is going to reach down and rescue the people that are written in the book. Now, if you take that and you synthesize it with what it says in in the book of Zechariah, 12 through 14, which talks about that instant when Christ does come back to the earth, when Israel is near extinction, when finally all of Hitler's dreams and all of the Crusaders' dreams and all of the uh, dreams of of people throughout the centuries, even to this present time, uh, the, the dream of the leaders of the Arab Confederation, when their dream is finally fulfilled, they believe, that they can finally extinguish Israel. Now, the Bible says that that's going to happen when Israel seems to be at their most peaceful time. Did you read today's paper? It says all the Arab nations in the Providence Journal are jockeying to make deals with Israel because everyone knows that the, the financial and economic future for the Arab world is how they relate to Israel. Now that, I mean, that is staggering. That has never been in the history of this planet been that people wanted to relate to Israel other than a brief time in Solomon's time when militarily he conquered everybody around him and David and they they decide to acquiesce to their rule and and help but there's coming a time when Israel is going to be very very peaceful and when Israel is going to be able to lay down their arms and I don't know if you realize from the paper but there's never been a time in history we've been at a period or a point where that was happening. But right now, Jordan and Syria and all of the other surrounding Arab nations, Egypt a long time ago with Anwar Sadat and and everybody else, they are really jockeying to make peace with Israel. And only when there's peace will you lay down your arms. Only when there's not hordes of missiles shining down your throat. Only when there aren't tanks on the border would you ever think of lowering your guard. And the Bible says Israel is going to lower their guard. And they're going to not be armed to the teeth. And what's amazing is that that time is coming. But when that time comes, then they're tricked. And this world leader that we've been talking about in Revelation swoops in. And he takes them and he's ready to annihilate them. He has desecrated their temple they set up over there somewhere. I'm not sure where it's going to be in Jerusalem, but they're going to have a temple back. And, and he desecrates that, and they all start running off, and the Bible tells us they run off into the, the valley that's between Israel and Jordan, and they're hiding. And they're getting closed in on as the armies of the world encircle them. And at that moment, this is what, at that time, verse 1, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, that's Israel, will arise, and there will be a time of great distress, has never occurred since there was a nation until that time, And at that time, your people, he's talking to Daniel, he's talking to Daniel as a Jew of Jewish people, everyone who's found written in the book. That's why we're looking at this verse. This book comes up again. We'll be rescued. And, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, if you want to know where... Uh, William Miller, who started the um, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, who, who broke off into now the Advent Christian Church, and, and the Jehovah's Witnesses came out of that, and many other groups. And William Miller was a Baptist preacher in the 1840s. If you want to know where the Advent Christian Church and many other churches get their soul sleep idea, it's from this verse. This is the verse. I was just at a conference two weeks ago with a big Advent Christian Church pastor, and, and it, just a nice guy, really loves the Lord. We were talking and sparring like pastors do about doctrine. And I says, where do you get that soul sleep from? And he says, it's in the Bible. I said, it's in one place. And I quoted this verse. He said, you're right. But he says, where do you get your view from? I said, it's in the Bible. He says, how many verses? I said, more than one. Uh, but 
But I mean, they know the Lord, and if they think they're going to be sleeping, this verse says that many of us sleep in the dust, but we know from the New Testament that our bodies sleep in the dust, and our souls are instantly in the presence of the Lord. But if he thinks his soul is sleeping, that's fine. There's no major error there. I mean, you can fellowship with someone like that. It's kind of like I'm sure there are many things that, that we deeply hold to that, that are not crucial doctrines that when we get there we're going to find out you know, that, that there are more people there than we thought. However, here's the important thing. That everyone who has found verse 1 written in the book. What is that talking about? Well, that explains what it says in Romans 9, 10, and 11 where it says all of Israel will be saved. The Apostle Paul says, and, and we'll look at this later, that at that crucial moment when Christ is coming down in the clouds and when the Antichrist forces are converging in it and they're ready to just kill, they've got all the Jews in one place and just one good bomb will blow them all up and they're ready to go. At that instant, it says they look up and they believe. And people have always had trouble with that. They say, well, wait a minute. How come he doesn't do that over in India somewhere and get about 100 million people to believe all at once? Or why doesn't he do that right in the heart of Africa and get all those pygmies to believe? Because the ones that are written, look at verse 1, in the book will be rescued. This book's very important. And, and I won't go any further because I'm not preaching on Daniel, but the whole thing I'm showing you these two verses for is this book is going to determine on that climactic instant of history when Israel is ready to finally be extinguished the remnant is what they're called which is the people that are really Israelites the ones that really know God that are really going to respond to him those people God already knows who they are and they're written in his book that's all this verse says and so we'll keep going now go to Luke chapter 10 and verse 20 and by the way all I'm doing with you is just establishing with you that there is a book of life and that it's not just merely apocalyptically spoken of off the cuff by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, but it's a fabric, it's a thread, it's a theme that goes all the way through the Bible. And when it goes through the Bible, it says that it is is of imperative import to all of us that our names are in that book, because God has staked everything on that book, because it's the book of the Lamb who shed His blood for lost people. It says in Luke chapter 10, this is Jesus Christ, who knew well the Old Testament. The Jews knew much about this book of life. Uh, Malachi calls another book a book of remembrance. That's not the book of life. It's the book of remembrance where God keeps track of what everybody's doing and will judge them according to their works. But this is what Christ said. Uh, they all came back, the 70. Remember, he sent them out two by two, 35 teams, and they were out evangelizing around uh, Israel only. They couldn't go outside of Israel. And when they came back, they were all excited. And they said, wow, you know, the snakes didn't kill us, and the demons were, you know, wow, we were really successful. And this is what Jesus said in verse 20 of Luke 10. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. That's not a big deal. He said, you know, Satan has a lot of spirits that are subject to him. Don't don't think that's a big deal. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Ah, he's talking about this book again. He's talking about this, this register, this role, this book, the book, the book of life, the book in heaven, that your name can be registered in and enrolled in. Next text is in Philippians chapter 4. Now, this is really great. Philippians 4 and verse 3. And the Apostle Paul says this, uh, I'll start in verse 1, because the first century church had all the problems that the 20th century church has, and uh, the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. I urge, and here we go, two people, he calls them by name. I urge this gal named Yodia, Yodia, that means uh, um, the female ending there, that's a lady's name. And I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. There were two very well-known women in the church that were feuding, that were not getting along. And they were hindering the church. And I don't know if you know anything about your body, but if your um, parts of your body start feuding back and forth, your body doesn't operate very well. 
if, uh, if say, that your, your uh, foot gets out, then your whole body's out because you're limping. And if, if uh, your, one of your kidneys starts failing you, it puts an extra drag on the other one, and, and you really want to take care of that. And if one of your lungs fills with fluid, the other one's overworking, and you have problems. And our body needs to work together. And he says, you, you all, and he's already said it, you're all one body. And he says, you two members of the body, you two women that are so important to the Lord and to the body of Christ, stop having this feud. And I don't know if it was an overt one or if it was a covert one. But he knew about it. And I don't know if he knew about it because it was a revelation from God or because he could see it. But I hope some of you that that have feuds realize that that you hold back the body of Christ at Kudneset if everything's not settled between you and everyone else. It doesn't mean that, that you can have everything resolved to the bottom degree, but you stop the fighting. Because he said, live in harmony in the Lord. And, and how do we live in harmony with the Lord? We can't go back and relive our life. We just say, I, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And, and you have to go on from there. And he says, do that. But then this is what he says. Verse 3. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together, together with Clement also and with the rest of my fellow workers. And here's the key, whose names are in the book of life. Now we're getting a little more pointed. The Apostle Paul knew that that Yodia, Syntyche, Clement, and some others were written in the book of life. Now how did he know that? It's an amazing thing to think of that the Apostle Paul could talk to two sinning believers and give them the assurance that God loved them so much in spite of the fact they were sinning and fighting and tussling back and forth in the church and messing up the Lord's work. He loved them so much that they were still in the book of life. So I think there's something to be drawn from that, that it's not just perfect people that are in that book. It's saved sinners. Okay, another text, and we have to keep going. Revelation 3 and verse 5, and this is where we're really going to come to a key point. Revelation 3 and verse 5, and uh, this message is a, is a direct message from Jesus Christ. It's a letter he has John. He dictates to the Apostle John to send to a specific local church. Revelation 3. There are seven letters. And this letter in chapter 3, verse 5, is a letter to the church in Sardis. And this letter is very revealing. Because this is the church that had a name and they were dead. Uh, verse 1 says that. He says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. And he says, wake up and complete your works and remember, verse 3, what you've received and heard and repent. And and he's giving them a very, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving a very stern message. And then look at verse 5. And this is what he says, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments. That's important. Did you know no one in heaven is going to not have white garments because the white garments... It says in Revelation 19, are the righteousness of Christ that we wear as saints. And so he says, if you overcome, you will have white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. That's one of the more crucial statements. He says, I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So he's talking to a church. And to that church, he says, wake up. Start living the life of Christ on this earth. Repent of your deadness. Repent of your laxity and of your sin. And if you will do that, and if you are an overcomer, you'll wear white garments. I'm going to confess your name, and I'm not going to erase your name. Well, now we've added a little bit more to our study, because Moses knew there was a book And he knew that your righteousness, whether or not you were a sinner or not, determined that. And God says, my book is my book, and people in there are the ones in there that have turned from their sin. And then we get a little later, and and the psalmist says it's a book of of people uh, that are righteous, that are alive. And then we get to Daniel, and he says, God even knows who's going to trust in him at that last moment of human history, as we know it. And, and, you know, I mean, this sounds magnificent and it sounds massive, but now we get here and we find out speaking to the church, Christ says, watch out, lest I erase your name out of this book. 
Well, here are some questions that you need to ask. What does it mean to have your name blotted out? What does it mean? All of a sudden, are we into Hebrews chapter 6? Are we into you can lose your salvation? And I think that's important. I'm not going to expound on Hebrews 6 tonight except for this. Hebrews 6 is a poor text for Arminians. Arminians, there's a whole denomination of people, the Wesleyan Church and a lot of the Methodist Church and uh, a lot of the Charismatic Churches and the Pentecostal Holiness, and, and those churches are what are called Arminian. And there are also free will Baptists that are Arminian too. And what they believe is that you can get saved and you can lose it and you can get saved and lose it. And they base that on Hebrews 6. The only problem is Hebrews 6 does not say you can get saved and lose it and get saved and lose it. Hebrews 6 says, the only thing Hebrews 6 says is, anybody that loses it will never have an opportunity to be saved. Period. That's all Hebrews 6 says. It's the most solemn warning in the Scriptures. It says, if you've looked Christ full in the face, and if you have seen what he has to offer, and you've said, eh, don't want anything to do with that, uh uh-uh, you'll never see him again the rest of your life. That's all Hebrews 6 says. And Hebrews 6 never describes a Christian because nothing in Hebrews 6 is ever used anywhere in the Bible to describe a Christian. It describes people that get real close to seeing the power of God. So Hebrews 6 is not a good text to say you can get salvation and lose it. But if there ever was a text that says you can get it and lose it, it's verse 5 of Revelation 3. This is the touchstone. And basically, without boring you, and this is a fascinating study, and I know the, the men in seminary, it's always fun to have uh, those seminary students here that have to track all this down. You can spend lots of hours on this, but for all of you that aren't seminary, I'll share with you what, what about 50 different commentators said. They basically said four things. I'll read you the views, and then I'll share with you. I really think the last one is biblical and is true. The first view is that this is a poetic figure of speech called litotes. That doesn't mean much to you. But what that is, is it's a poetic term that means you affirm something by de- denying its opposite. And so if you say uh, that you hate to sleep, that means you like to be awake. And so if someone went around and says, I hate to sleep, poetically speaking, what they're saying is, I like to be awake. And that's called litotes. And it's just a figure of speech. And I don't think that's what Christ is saying. I don't think he's um, is, is playing around here in poetic terms. So that, that's a nice one. And Dean Alford and H.V. Sweet and some other old commentators thought that because they just didn't know what to do with this. Second view is that this is an allusion to a civic birth record. In other words, um, and there is some merit here, he says, erase his name from the book. If you look, this chapter 3, verse 1 says to the church of Sardis, and if you know anything about Sardis, you know that the king of Sardis did have a register of everybody that lived in his kingdom. And when they were born, he put their name down so he could collect taxes, and when they died, he'd erase their name. So in a little sense, that's a good view, but it doesn't explain what's happening. It's kind of a cop-out that people can be erased and people can be there. The third, uh, that's the second view. The third view is it refers to one losing their salvation. And the good Lutheran commentator Lange had that view, and of course it's consonant with his denomination and everything else. They believe they can lose it, and so that's what he said it meant. But if it says you can lose your salvation... It's interesting because it doesn't say that. It says, uh, I will not erase his name. He didn't say, I will erase him. He says, I will not erase his name. So this is actually not a, a threat. It's almost a promise. And so the very last thing you can get from it is a threat, if that's what you're looking for. Here's the fourth view. And uh, this is uh, what the host of uh, commentators said. And, and I really agree, and I'll, I'll show you why in just a moment. But it refers to a book containing, now listen to this, the book of life is a book containing all humanity who have possessed physical life. That means from the first two human beings, Adam and Eve. And isn't that interesting? Um, I was talking with Jim, and I never heard him say that before. Uh, He said at the retreat, he said, God didn't create Adam and Steve, you know, two men. He didn't create two women. God's plan, contrary to what the, the very powerful homosexual lesbian lobby says is God said the only way to be in consonance with his eternal plan is for one man and one woman. If you're going to be married, you have to be married to uh, the opposite sex. But that God has a record of everyone from the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, all their descendants, but they are erased at death after having rejected Christ. In other words, this book is written... And the more I've thought about this, I agree that God is not willing that any should perish, so he's kept track of everyone. 
And when Jesus Christ died, he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And he loved the whole world. And he offers to all who have ever lived from the Garden of Eden to the last soul in the millennium. He offers them salvation. And if they live their life and reject Christ, those are erased from the book. And listen, those who do receive Christ have their place confirmed by him. You say, now wait a minute, now that causes me more problems, right? You say, does that mean that that God doesn't know how it's going to turn out yet? Does that mean that I can't be sure I'm going to make it? That he doesn't even know yet? Does that mean that God has got these super-powered binoculars and he's looking down at the finish line trying to see who's going to make it? Well, that's why I said this is more than just tonight. I think when we get together again, we're going to have to talk about what does God's sovereignty mean to me and to you? And I think that the Bible says enough about it that, that we need to know what the Bible really says about this whole concept of for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate, knows he predestinated, he called, knows he called, he justified, knows he justified, he sanctified, and those he sanctified, he glorified. And all those he speaks about as done events. And so, in other words, we have a real conflict here. Because what we have is, we have a book of life that people can get erased from if they reject Christ. But we also have a sovereign God that knows who's going to be in that book. So, let's just do the first one and go back to Revelation 17 with me. And let's take this verse in location and take it apart, verse 8. And tonight, just look at three very powerful truths that we can see in this book of Revelation 17, in this verse specifically specifically verse 8. Because the point tonight is when you think of the book of life, I want you to think of security. The ultimate security. And this is why. Verse 8. Three points. Number one, it says, this beast that you saw was and is not, and he's about to come up out of the abyss or the bottomless pit. First point, we, it says in verse 8, we know that Satan is our adversary. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about this this demonically inspired beast, the Antichrist, who who was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. We know that we have an adversary, Satan. And we know tonight that we have an adversary who is after us. That's the first point that John was bringing up. And you've got to know that in relation to the book of life. Secondly, the second thing it says in here is, not only is he this adversary, but it says, secondly, and those who dwell on the earth will wonder. And I've told you this before, but you might have forgotten that the book of Revelation talks about unsafe people as earth dwellers. And Christ said that born-again people are not citizens of this planet. They're citizens of heaven. They are not comfortable here. You know, no matter how much I putter around in my garden, no matter how much I caulk around and, and, and uh, you know, repair stuff and patch holes and paint and wallpaper around the parsonage, and no matter how much I, you know, just, just do things to, to make life, you know, so, so that everything will be as nice as it can be, you really are never totally comfortable here. Because I know this isn't where my home is. That's what the songwriter said. This world is not my home. And even though we can enjoy our family, we can enjoy our our ministry for Christ, and even though we can enjoy all the, the pleasures that God has given us on earth that are righteous to enjoy, when it's all said and done, it's kind of like when you're on one of these study tours like I lead every so often. It's fun while it lasts, but it's not real life. You're, you're, you're not in reality. You're, you're on a tour. And you know your home and the bills and everything else is waiting for you when you get back. And you've got to mow the lawn and everything else. And that's kind of how it is when you're here on this planet. You know that this is not your ultimate destiny, that this is not your, your goal in life to be here. It's not here. And so what he's saying here is the people who dwell on the earth will wonder, these earth dwellers. So, so secondly, positively, not only do we know that Satan is our adversary, but secondly, we are citizens of heaven if you're in this book of life. And here's the last one. We have a secure salvation because he says this, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. 
You know what he's saying? The people who are going to follow Satan, the guy out of the bottomless pit, the people who are earthbound, earth dwellers, and the people who are not written in the book of life are not going to heaven. They're going to reject God's plan of salvation. So you know what we can get positively out of that? We know that our adversary is Satan. We are citizens of heaven. And we have a very secure salvation. Now I know that this is a complicated thing, but I want you to get it. And so that's why I'm coming at it this way. I could just tell you that the book of life means you're secure, but I want you to work through this with me. So, so here, start walking with me through the Bible. Go to Genesis 3 with me just briefly, and we only have a few minutes tonight. But Genesis 3, we're going to talk about our adversary. And I don't know if you realize this, but the personality of the Holy Spirit and the reality of a, of a living personal devil both became out of vogue in this century. And a lot of people don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. A lot of people don't think that Satan is really a person. And I don't know if you realize this, but the whole doctrine of salvation is built around the fact that a real literal devil tempted a real literal woman who shared the temptation with a real literal husband who fell into sin and cursed the entire race. That's what salvation is predicated on. And if you don't believe that there's a real devil, and if you don't believe that there's a real person of the Godhead called the Holy Spirit that calls people to salvation, then you don't have a real salvation because that's biblical salvation. Well, here's the real literal devil in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. He starts talking to the woman. And look at verse 15. This is the curse that God puts. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And that, of course, is the promise to Eve of her seed coming, because a woman can't have seed. And this is a promise of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And this is a promise that someday Satan would be crushed by Christ. But what we learn from the third chapter of Genesis is, starting in verse 1, that Satan is a stalker. He is the stalker of mankind. He saw God's perfect creation. He went down there and he said, my desire is to defile this. And it wasn't like it was off the charts. It was part of God's plan. Because remember, it's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before Adam and Eve were even created, God knew how it was going to turn out. He knew what they were going to need. And the lamb of God had already been chosen as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And so when Satan snuck down there and started stalking around in the Garden of Eden and and took and inhabited a serpent, which, by the way, from the Bible, serpents used to walk, and they were the most beautiful animals of all before they were cursed. And that's why he said, you're going to be in the dust for the rest of your life. That was part of the curse on the serpent. And you say, well, wait a minute, how do we know this is Satan? Because it says in the Bible in chapter 12 of Revelation, the old serpent, the dragon from old, Satan. See, he was the stalker of humanity from the very beginning. Now look at Job chapter 1, because he didn't just stalk us, but it says in Job chapter 1 that he's also the accuser. If you find the middle of your Bible, that's Psalms, the book of Psalms, and the book just before it, back one book, is Job. In chapter 1, we find that Satan isn't just stalking. You know, stalking is you're following someone around and causing them problems, and that's what he was doing, and and kind of hissing temptations at Eve, and he got her to fall. But he doesn't just stalk around. He does more than that. It says in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present them before the Lord, and Satan was also among them. And the Lord talks to him, and he says, Where have you been? He says, I've been roaming on the earth, walking on it. That means Satan is not omnipresent. He can only be one place at once. And verse 8 says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one's like him. And what Satan is doing is, he is, from that point on, revealed as the accuser. And he's the one that's accusing Job. And Satan answered the Lord, verse 9, Doesn't Job fear the Lord for nothing? Or does Job fear the Lord for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him? Why, he's a rich man. You know, he's got everything. Why wouldn't he love you? And what Satan is doing is he's showing that, that Satan is our adversary. Not only does he stalk humanity, seeking to undermine the plan of God, But he doesn't just bother us. He's bothering God. If it's possible for an eternal, infinite, changeless, immutable God to be bothered, that's a human concept. He bothers God. He pesters God about us. And he is Satan. And that's what his name means. Satan means the accuser. And I don't know if you realize that, but tonight Satan is accusing Christians before God's throne. 
You know what he's saying? Do you know what she did this week? You know, we, we feel bad enough if we sin, but isn't it awful that Satan knows that we sin and prompted sometimes and helped that to happen? And he's up there in front of God saying, do you know what he did this week? And, and he's the accuser. He's the stalker. Here's a third one. John chapter 8, verse 44. Another crucial verse to know about Satan. Satan, so that we can be aware of him, we need to uh, have an understanding of what he's up to. He's not just stalking. By the way, Peretti, you know, has really gone overboard with this. People, when they read the Peretti books, you know, they're like this. They, you know, I'm sure there's some yellow-eyed, sulfur-breathing monster in the balcony right now up there, you know, messing up Cal's music books or something. I'm sure there, but, you know, it, it kind of uh, overdoes it. But this is what the Bible really says that he's doing. Verse 44 of chapter 8. You are of your father the devil. Christ wasn't, he had never been through Carnegie's make friends and influence people uh, course because Jesus is talking to people, religious leaders, and he says, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. James said the same thing. Lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin. We have those lustful desires of our father the devil and that's our, our lifelong struggle through the word of God to put them down. But if we don't, you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. How do you think Cain thought up murdering Abel? How do you think Dr. Joseph Mengele thought up killing all those Jews? How do you think Hitler thought up his, his devious... Did you know they used, Hitler used to crucify people in the SS headquarters? I mean, he used to... Why did, how did he think of crucifying? He had such a demented mind against God. He wanted to, to even defile the, the, the very portrait of redemption, the, the death of Christ on our behalf. So he used to crucify and let people die on crosses in Berlin. Where did he think of that? Verse 44, he was a murderer. Satan was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. When there, there is no truth in him, when he speaks... A lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. You know what Satan is? Satan is a stalker as our adversary. Satan is one who's accusing us who know Christ. Satan is the one who is a liar and he's implanting evil desires and he's planting lies. And primarily that's coming out in the in the education system and in the scientific community. Um, that The book I was telling you about that I read this month, after all the scientific facts came out, you know what the scientists said? That we're going to think up something else because we will not accept the fact that there has to be a creator. We will not accept that fact. That's what Stephen Hawking, supposedly one of the most brilliant men in the world, yet any of you here tonight that knows Christ no more than him. Because he categorically says, I will not accept that there is a being greater than man. I will not accept that. And that's the lie of Satan. One more. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Because I want you to see, really, God's perspective of the planet. 1 John 5, and verse 19. It says this, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That should give you great comfort that, that even though the whole world, the whole planet is basking in the darkness of Satan. And there's some parts of the world that I've been in and sometimes uh, together with Bonnie that we've been in. And as Christians, it just makes, it makes your hair stand up in the back of your neck. And it just makes you feel the power of darkness. Uh, Haiti is a place like that with all the the wickedness there. Some Muslim countries I've been in, it's so strong, the demonic power. Japan, especially around Kyoto with those old Shinto temples where they've been worshiping Satan for a thousand, two thousand years. Egypt, uh, you can go some places in this world where you can feel what God sees. Verse 19, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Satan is our adversary. He's a stalker. He's an accuser. He's a liar. And he's the God of the earth dwellers. Now back to Revelation 17, real quickly. Because the second point is, not only 
is Satan our adversary, but we're citizens of heaven. Look what he says here. He describes the people that aren't God's people. Secondly, he describes them as the earth dwellers. And their God is 1 John 5, 19, Satan. They're lying in his power. And so when you bump up against it at school, when you bump up against it with your college professors, just speak out for Christ sometime in a public school. Just say something, and you'll feel it. Because they're in the power of the evil one, and they want to suppress the truth. A friend of mine, I preached at his church in San Francisco, and, and uh, Jerry uh, Burchett, who's not well, he's not here tonight, he always sits over here, but Jerry gave me a paper about my good friend, who, who Hamilton Square Baptist Church, right in downtown San Francisco. I remember staying in the church. They have apartments in their church. And you can look out and you can see the beauty of the San Francisco skyline. The homosexual lesbian community, hundreds of them, stormed the church. And they broke everything they could break. And they dragged people out the windows. And they, they did as much damage. They were screaming. They were knocking down the doors. They were going after children and scaring them. Now, they didn't, they didn't injure anyone. They just scared people. They scratched them. They scared them to death. But he was preaching a week-long series on the sin of sodomy. And it so bothered them that it was a reenactment of Genesis 19. They were clawing at the doors, saying, Give us the kids. Give us those little boys. We're coming in. And they beat the doors down of his church. They called the police. The police came and stood around the perimeter of the Hamilton. And this is all, I mean, this is in the paper. This is 1993, the United States of America. The police came and stood like this around the perimeter, and they said, the city council would not let us interfere with a nonviolent demonstration. And they didn't do anything. They said the insurance company will cover the damage, and no people have been hurt. Now, if that's California in 1993, that's going to be Rhode Island 1998. And that is the example of the suppression of truth that our world is in. And it shouldn't alarm you, and it shouldn't depress you. You know what that tells me? That... This world is right on schedule because God says it's going to get darker and darker and darker and darker and you and I are going to shine lighter and lighter and lighter and Satan is going to try and suppress us and we're going to pay for our faith in Christ and it's going to cost us dearly because no one's going to want to hear us and the Antichrist is going to increase his grip on this world until he can kill everybody that names the name of Christ because you won't be able to buy any food or sell or get any money out of the bank unless you will swear allegiance to him. And at that instant, he's got his power. Now, I believe the church won't be here then, but there'll be many Christians still here, and they'll be executed. But what it says here in Revelation 17 and verse 8, that these people, these people who are enmeshed in the darkness, and by the way, it doesn't mean that they're wicked appearing people. There are people that are totally enmeshed in darkness that smile all the time, they're very upbeat, they're positive, they, they run crystal shops all around you, they, they, they are into all kinds of you know, holistic medicine, and they're into health, and, and uh, even natural food, some of them. I mean, they're really nice people, they live all around us. But if they have never bowed to Jesus Christ, if they're not citizens of heaven, then they're in the power of the evil one. And that's our goal. We don't know uh, who will reject the gospel and who won't, and that's why we have to keep telling them. And we have to keep loving them. But the second point that he brings out is, he says, they are earth dwellers. And what the truth is for us, and remember this book of Revelation is, is written primarily for the church right now, before all this happens. Because the church won't be here when all this happens. So it's for us now. And what's the truth we should derive from Revelation 17.8? We've already learned that Satan's our adversary, but what's another truth? The truth is, that there's only two choices. Either you're a citizen of earth and you act like it, or you're a citizen of heaven and you act like it. Now I want to ask you tonight, which do you think is pleasing to God? If you're a citizen of heaven and acting like a citizen of earth, or if you're a citizen of heaven and not acting like a citizen of earth? Which do you think will please him more? I want to show you real quickly. And we only have a few moments. Look at Matthew 6. Because there's some characteristics of citizens of heaven that Jesus Christ was drawing on us. And I don't know if you realize it, but the greatest temptation on this planet is not sex. It's not pornography. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol. I mean, we all know about those things. I mean, they, they put them in dark little shops down the road here. They put them in dark taverns. It's not the occult. 
I mean, we all know that. No, everyone gets creeps going through cemeteries at night. Nobody thinks about that stuff. It's a very small segment that's interested in all that stuff. Most of the people you live around are not tempted with all the, the filth of licentious living. You know what they're tempted with? And we're tempted with it too. And many of us succumb to it. It's right here in Matthew 6, verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. Because that's what earth dwellers do. Don't put all of your treasures. Don't put them down here. Because what will happen is wherever your treasures are, your heart will be, the Lord said. And where your heart is, is where your treasures are. It's, it's a reciprocal relationship. And it's just like uh, if you hear about an earthquake in California, if you have someone you love there, immediately your heart goes out and you get on the phone and you say, are you all right? Why? Because you have a treasure in California, someone you love. If you hear about a, a massive hurricane sweeping up through Florida and you happen to have your parents or grandparents living down there or your children in school down there, you immediately jam the phone line because that's where your treasure is. If you're driving home from work and you see fire trucks going by, it doesn't bother you because it's somebody else's house unless they're on your street. And then you start getting scared because your family's there. And you wonder, because your treasures are there. You know what the Lord says? Make your treasures not things. Make them people. And he says, verse 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because it will cause you anxiety. Moth and rust will destroy it. You'll always be trying to do something to protect it. Thieves will break in and steal. You'll have to have a security system, an alarm system. This is the most unusual country in the world. I was talking with Jim uh, Berg. We had a great time. It's good to talk to old friends. And we were just talking, and one night we just talked all the way around the world. We talked about all different countries that we've traveled in and everything. And when we got all done, I thought, now I've only been in a fourth of all the countries of the world, and there's none like America. I have never been in a... Did you know most of the countries don't even have locks on their doors? Did you know... I've been all over China. I, I didn't see any locks. A billion people live there. What do you lock up? All you have is your rice bowl and your mat. What are you going to lock it for? They don't even have windows in some of the parts of the world. And you know what's amazing? And he's talking to us today because we are most responsible. We have the most light. We have the most wealth. I have the most responsibility for those two things. You sitting here tonight know more and probably 90% of all the Christians in the world know because they don't have time to sit around and read their Bible and listen to Christian radio and read all the books that you buy at the bookstore sale. Do you know what they do? They're trying to work enough to get enough food to survive so that they can take one day a week off and be intimate with God and go to church. That's how the majority of Christians live in this world. And you and I, you know what we're thinking about? I'm going to open another account because you know, I want to make sure that I can you know, make sure my kids have a way all the way through school. And I'm going to get a second job because we want to pay the boat off so that we can, you know, buy the cabin so that we can make sure that we have, you know, when we retire. And you know what they're thinking about? Am I going to have enough food to eat when I'm too old to work? They don't plan on retiring. They wonder if they're going to survive. And you know what Christ is saying? I think it's something. It's the number one temptation of this crowd tonight, you and me alike. We're all materialistic. We were born that way. How are you doing it beaten down, laying up for yourselves treasure? This word lay up is the word for stack. You know what it is? In the ancient world, if you had more than one of anything, you were hoarding. They only had one coat. They only had one bowl. They just had one. And Christ said, don't stack stuff. Don't, and, and the word is actually to lay down on his side so you can, and, and you know, they would lay down bolts of clothing and they would lay down uh, wedges of gold and, and they would stack them up. He says, don't stack the stuff up. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves, here's the positive, that was the negative, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. God says, you know, we don't have any moths up there. Things don't rust. And all the thieves are barred from entrance in heaven. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to have ulcers worrying about someone stealing it all. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Number one, earth dwellers are living for the moment and they're living for the earth because that's all they have. Citizens of heaven aren't. Now how do, you, how do you do on that test? 
At the couples retreat, Jim says, whatever you worry about is, is what your security is and what you're really investing in your life. What do you worry about? Do you want to get that pension so bad? Then you have a false security. Do you want to you want to get that promotion? That's the that's that'll make it. I'll be happy finally if I get the promotion. You have a false security. That's a treasure on earth. You know, all of us could do with about 90% less than what we have. Even the poorest person here tonight could do with much less than what we have. It only stands in the way. It only clutters our lives. It only causes us heartache because we get upset because, you know, we're in this accretion mode and we're trying to get everything and someone's getting it faster, so we try faster. And it just, it just t- saps our energy. The care of riches. And I know very wealthy people. I, I know Christians. I have a Christian friend that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's an amazing fellow. You know what he told me? He said, I never went to school. If I lost it all today, I'd still be happy. And maybe that's why the Lord gave him hundreds of millions of dollars. One of the most generous people I know. I've never seen him meet a Christian ministry that, that he believed in, that he didn't write him a check on the spot for... I was with him, gave one group 100000 gave another group 100000 That's wonderful. That's not us. I mean, that, you know, that's not where we are. We have our needs met as we wait on God. But most of us are, are trying so hard to pile up stuff, and citizens of heaven don't do that. Secondly, Philippians 3.20. Citizens of heaven, number one, are not laying up stuff on earth. And some of you need to go back to your little room where you work on your checkbook and all of your investments and and where you have all those phone numbers and all those account numbers and everything else. And what you need to do is you need to say, if I died tonight, what difference would it make for all that stuff? And then maybe reinvest them for heavenly things. That's an important thing to think about. But secondly, Philippians 3.20. The second aspect, the second crucial indicator of whether or not you're a citizen of heaven or a citizen of earth is not only that that you're not laying up your treasures on earth, you're laying them up in heaven, but secondly Philippians 3.20 says you are longing for Christ to come back. And I don't know if you realize this, but the Christian life is a very integrated life. Very integrated. If my treasures are on earth, and I'm going to be looking down, I'm not going to be looking up. It's a very interesting thought. It all fits. And this is what it says in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state. You know what our generation is doing? We're spending $22 billion a year to paint our faces in America. That's how much just facial makeup is spent. You compute that out. Do you know how much that is per person? My goodness. And the men, most men don't even wear it, you know. I have a few friends in college who used to put on that suntan stuff, you know, and they look, you know, the ultra tan. But so it must be the ladies spending $22 billion on all that stuff. We're spending $14 billion a year to make our bodies smaller. And a simple key is just cut back. I mean, why, why spend all that money on, on the diet centers? Just cut back. But look, he says, verse 21, he'll transform the body of our humble state. Most of us don't have humble state bodies. I mean, we're, we're dressing them better than most people dress throughout all of history. But, but look at the expectancy. Our citizenship, where we're expecting to go, is in heaven. And we are eagerly awaiting Christ. He's going to transform us, verse 21, into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power which He has to subject all things to Himself. That's a triumphant verse. Do you know what citizens of heaven are like? They're like the families that love their daddies and their husbands that stand out at at, uh, Norfolk when those big carriers and those big ships come into port. You ought to see the sight of those families looking and looking and waiting for that one they love to come. Now, the families that aren't too much in love, they just say, hey, grab a taxi when you get in, you know, and come home. But the ones that love the appearing of that loved one. They're there eagerly waiting. And that's a characteristic. That's, that's the heartthrob of a citizen of heaven. They're eagerly waiting Christ. Here's the last one, Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about people that really please God because they have faith. They might not have a lot of other stuff, but they have faith. 
In Hebrews 11, in two verses, verse 10 and verse 13, tell us that, that citizens of heaven look like this. Not only they're laying up their treasures in heaven, not only they can't wait for the bus to take them to heaven, but thirdly, look at this. Verse 10 of Hebrews 11, For he was looking for the city, the city, okay, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. 